Let's kick off. I'll start again. All right. <laughs> Let's kick this back off again. And I, I'm going to just check to see among the members of CPAC. Yeah, we have a good group. And we have a few new folks to welcome to our policy roundtable. So let's introduce them and then, and then dive in. You go to the next slide. I think we've got the full list of people. All right, we are fortunate to continue to benefit from Adrija, um, Adrija's presence and Marsha and the two clinical experts, uh, Pushpa and um, Gordon. And, um, we have uh, met uh, Dr. Phillips before, Glenn Phillips from Argenix, um, but some people tune in just for the um, just for the policy roundtable anyway. So, Glenn, do you want to say hi again? Just introduce yourself. Oh, I hope Glenn is here. Sorry. Uh, yes, okay. uh, Glenn Phillips, senior director of health economics and outcomes research at uh, Argenix. I have no other uh, conflicts or bias to disclose beyond being an employee for Argenix. Thank you again. All right, and um, let me just check. I saw Kim Grant, so let's let her introduce herself first. I'll check to make sure that Emily's here, but Kim, welcome, and please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, my name's Kimberly Grant. I'm currently a clinical pharmacist with IPD Analytics, um, and I have no financial disclosures. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Why don't you tell me what IPD Analytics, why would we have you at the table today? What do you know? Sure. Yeah, we provide um, payer and provider insights for not only drugs that are available on the market, but also kind of follow the pipeline very closely. Um, and so trying to determine what management strategies might look like for a lot of these drugs that are in the pipeline, um, especially those for rare diseases, those with a high cost, um, and kind of, kind of assess the landscape of what's going on currently, um, and then what might happen in the future as well. Great. So thank you for bringing that uh, intelligence, if you will, uh, to us from your experience. I'll ask you several questions later on about the broader landscape of payers, but we're very fortunate to also have one payer in particular here with us today, and that's Emily Sow from Primera. Hi, Emily. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Emily Shaw, and I am a clinical pharmacist at Primera Blue Cross, um, and I have no other conflicts of interest as those. Okay. So we've got a lot of the voices at the table that we would need to talk about uh, how we're gonna get this right. For those of you who watched, again, my opening set of slides, if the goal is to create a platform for not just welcoming current innovation, but making sure that we have the resources to welcome and incentivize future innovation, while also being able to create a structure of healthcare pricing and access, that means that patients can get access to new innovations at a price that the system and they will find uh, affordable over the long term, making the right trade-offs between the price and our ability to afford it. So we've got a lot of places we could start and I'd like to actually go back to the patients um, as we start out here, because that, you know, after, after that whirlwind experience of having the evidence discussed and then all those votes, sometimes you end up leaving a feeling that we've still missed something or something's been underappreciated. But I also, I know one thing we haven't talked about that I do know is an issue, which is apparently diagnosis of myasthenia gravis is a pretty hit and miss thing for a lot of patients. I think Adrija, you were making the comment that it was years before yours was adequately diagnosed, am I right? But is there anything, because we're gonna to start to frame some policy recommendations, how can we work with the clinical community to help improve the timely diagnosis of myasthenia gravis as new treatments do become available and as earlier treatment might start to be even more important. Have there been any policy efforts or initiatives to improve uh, kind of diagnostic uh, kind of um, process in, in the US? Any that you're aware of? Adrija, go ahead. Oh. Are you asking uh, uh, from yeah, a patient's no, no, perspective? You do. Yeah, well, from the patient's perspective, and I'll well, you can chime in on any of that if there's something that you feel like we kind of didn't do adequate uh, coverage of, but also just in terms of the diagnostic part of this, because we're going to move on to talk about pricing and coverage and other things, but diagnosis mm -hmm. is still really important. And my understanding is that it's, from many perspectives, not as good as it should be. Um, yes, I think that. Um, 
for one, from my personal experience, um, initially my diagnosis, uh, we tried to use Tensilin, which is a very common uh, drug used initially. And uh, of course, as I said before, I have a must positive. So it wasn't something that was readily known about or known about at all at the time. But the hospital that I initially went to for this diagnosis thought that their medication was old. They hadn't had a, a, a patient to even try it on in so long. And so I, I tested negative several times. And then I ended up going to another hospital that um, was in a, in a more metropolitan uh, progressive city and their medication um, initially just on very first usage came back positive. But I think that when you're looking at MG patients, it's so important to keep in mind that maybe with a lot of other illnesses, there's always going to be a standard protocol. There's always going to be a standard drug that you use to test initially. But with some of us, it may not, we may not respond the same way. Um, and that there needs to be an understanding that it's going to be a multifaceted uh, level of options. It should always be. And that also extends to the initial treating drugs too, would be my, my comments. Okay, thank you. Marcia, did you, did you want to add anything about uh, diagnosis or, or follow on to Adrija's comments or anything? No, I'd be glad to. Um, so my diagnosis came after about six to eight months after my parents noticed weakness. And um, it took a while. So like my first diagnosis, it was summertime and my family doctor said I was swimming underwater too much and they gave me salve to put in my nose. And of course that didn't help. And then um, I went to an ENT and, and he couldn't add anything to that. Um, and then finally, um, my family doctor said to my parents, she just wants attention. Because see, the nature of myasthenia is you wake up in the morning and you feel pretty strong. And then an hour later, you wanna go back to bed again, unless you're treated. And so that's sort of where I was and in those early days where um, the symptoms were accelerating too. Um, it was very frightening, and it wasn't until I woke up one morning and I had double vision that my parents took me to an eye doctor, and he had seen a few cases, and that's when I got diagnosed. So Tensilon um, wasn't around, well, it was around, but wasn't used, but they gave me some neostigmin um, at the time, and I improved greatly. And my father said to me, great, you're cured, we're going to go home, but um, that didn't happen for a couple of months. And um, basically, you know, um, I, I respond really well to Tensilon if I get it, um, it has been years, but, um, but I don't respond to a lot of the drugs and I am zero negative. I don't have ACHR antibodies. I don't have musk antibodies, but we know I've got antibodies because you put me on plasma exchange and I get better. Um, you give me prednisone, I get better. And, um, I'm looking for that drug that's really going to keep me stable and maintained, and and I hope one of these is one of them. So you're you're a great example of someone for whom future innovation is going to continue to be very important, given that you will fit into one of these easy slots of antibody positive, right? So moving over to the clinical experts, I don't know, just briefly again, if we were to help piggyback in some way onto something that's already going on or push something in the right direction. Is there anything around diagnosis? I mean, you guys probably see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Patients who are referred quickly to academic centers or to specialists in the community or patients who take way too long to get there. Is there anything that's been learned? Um, and Glenn, you may have also, in your work with the patient community, have some thoughts on this. Um, any, any ideas of what we could do to help improve the diagnostic phase of care here? Any thoughts, Gordon or Pushpa? I'm not aware of any initiatives that are around um, to improve it. Yes, it, it does become a long journey to diagnosis. And that is not unlike um, many other neuromuscular diseases as well, uh, uh, because of the rarity of the disorder and because people don't recognize the early symptoms. Um, it's, I think it's a question of education. Unlike some of the other neuromuscular diseases, the urgency in myasthenia gravis in terms of diagnosis, I think is the fact that we can treat uh, our patients and get them to feeling much better. So, um, and 
especially now with uh, the uh, the newer medications and many more coming in the pipeline, I think that early diagnosis is critical uh, and it should be education initiatives. I can't think of sort of a policy or any other initiative that can do it. It would be an education initiative, uh, I think, uh, that would be useful. Uh, there are patients who come to me and say, I have myasthenia gravis and I actually have it. There are others who come and say, I have myasthenia gravis and they absolutely don't. But, you know, but that kind of thing would be good too. Okay, for them right. to bring For them to bring up the diagnosis to their physicians. Yeah. Gordon, any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, Pushma brings up an important point point, which is um, uh, we, we sort of get hit from both sides of this, not we as physicians, but I think the community, that is that patients with the myasthenia gravis often have the journey we've heard. It takes a while to get diagnosed, but then there are also a large number of patients who are misdiagnosed with myasthenia, which is a challenge. Um, I can't think of a policy approach to this, but I will say I've seen in other therapeutic areas that when we have the level of excitement and energy that we now have in the pipeline, for myasthenia gravis, uh, there's a lot of education um, and a lot of interest, both because there's an urgency to take advantage of the treatments and frankly, because there are industry partners who are out there educating the public and educating uh, referring physicians. So I guess I'm hopeful that um, the current therapeutic landscape is going to lead to more education, more discussion. And for what it's worth, I see that in my, my junk box in my email where I'm now constantly getting emails about, do I want to learn about myasthenia gravis? Um, maybe that's because they think I have more to learn, which I know I do, but um, I, I think it's reflecting the environment we're in right now. Glenn, you and probably I, have a role in that somehow. Um, <laughs> I don't send those emails. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I would say is I'd reflect a lot of what Dr. Smith said that um, it, while this specific disorder, I think there's a lot to be learned by the medical community in general and by the public in general. But if you look back in time at other conditions that have had investment uh, in developing treatments, which you find is an improvement and an increase in, in diagnosis over time, I think MS is a good example of that. And a lot of these neurological conditions have these, this heterogeneity between patients and it, it can affect head to toe. And that makes it very difficult to correctly identify, especially when you don't, you know, you might see one in your medical career if you're not a neuromuscular specialist. And so I think to, to Dr. Smith's point, I, I think that the investment in developing treatments in the space has these kind of knock-on effects to improve these, the, the diagnosis as well as the, the awareness of the condition. Good. Yeah, we've heard that from other kind of rare disease communities that especially the first treatment that is approved uh, for a condition just can really transform the infrastructure for diagnosis and for referral and, and education. It starts to kind of roll downhill from there. So, but it is tough with a, with a condition that has such a diverse kind of phenotype, if you will. Um, all right, so we're headed kind of towards some of the bigger topics around coverage, pricing, and research. Um, before we get there, I mean, often a, kind of a foundation of that is the understanding of, of, of the choices that doctors really feel like they're going to have between different treatment courses for the same patients. So if we're looking at eculizumab and nefgartigimod here in particular, Gordon and Pushpa, I mean, are a lot of patients gonna be just basically, it could be one or the other. And, you know, I'm trying to understand if you were trying to kind of make comments or pr provide perspectives that you would want insurers to hear in particular, I think. And they wanna know like, you know, is it the same? Is it like, you know, one or the other for every patient or is there just gonna be really clear distinctions clinically that steer one patient towards one drug versus the other? What are, what are we seeing here as far as these two treatments in your, in your minds? Pushbar or Gordon, who, you, either one. Gordon, you, me? That's a hard question. Why don't you go first? <laughs> see, that's the gentleman, that. always the gentleman. He wears a bow tie. He can so get away with I'm going to I'm going to see him at the A&M in a couple of weeks. He'll buy me a bottle of wine there. That's for sure. Um, 
But uh, yeah, that is a hard question. So I think uh, we have to take a step back in the alg algorithm of treatment here before we even get to these two drugs. Where in the present algorithm do any of the new drugs work? You know, because we do get patients better with, our, with uh, steroids and with mycophenolate and azathioprine. We do get them better. So where do they work? The two studies are different. So Echolizumab looked at the refractory population and they de defined refractory in a certain way. There are many ways to define refractory. Uh, I've got uh, did not require refractoriness. Uh, you know, some of some uh, a small percentage of patients were not even on any other treatments. I believe uh, in the trial. So, um, so where then do they fit in the algorithm? I think that's a moving needle point there. Um, it's uh, you know when I first uh, when echolizumab first came out, I would be very careful. Uh, to go to patients who are truly refractory, you know, two, uh, two sometimes three drugs. Um, and now I look more at the side effect angle. I will say here outright, and I said it at the expert, um, the, the meeting earlier as well. So, uh, you know, I will say outright that every time, you know, I do it, there's this uh, sort of tension for me, uh, you know, ethical tension between uh, individual patient advocacy and individual benefit versus a societal perspective, perspective. I'll put it out right there. But despite that tension, the needle has been, at least for me, moving a little bit in the algorithm where I will tend to use it maybe. I, it's very, very seldom. I think I have one patient that I've used it as, as initial therapy uh, for various reasons, but it will be very seldom that I do that. I usually use it though after a first or a second the treatment has failed. I don't go beyond that. So I can I can tell you that it's within the first six or seven months of a diagnosis. So it's a little bit earlier. So that move, needle has moved. Now in terms of the two drugs, now in December, what happens when when FGARD comes out? I, I, I can't wait, as I think Gordon, you said, to know the trade name for this one, honestly. I, you know, I keep calling it FGARD now. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't decide whether to call it G or G. So anyway, <laughs> so uh, where does that fit? So that uh, the, the mechanism of action of the two is uh, so different that it makes it dif difficult. It is very easy when my patient has acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myosinia gravis. I have both choices. So, well, it's actually more difficult. But I have had some experience with echolizumab. Uh, I think a lot will depend then on... Uh, um, extraneous decisions. The side effect profile doesn't uh, doesn't uh, help me. The efficacy profile doesn't help me. A lot of it will def depend, I think, on extraneous decisions, including payer decisions, and also the fact that FGARD has this varying schedule. So, you know, it may end up being more convenient if somebody can just get a, a get four shots and then go for 12 weeks without it. So a lot in terms of patient preference. So I think a lot of other factors than just result factors will, uh, will be important in decision-making, especially the convenience associated with it. Uh, for seronegative patients, I think it's a good option, even if the data is not clear, because we know that these are um, um, probably antibody uh, have some kinds of antibodies and they respond to other measures. And if my seronegative patient is not doing well, but that would be down in the algorithm, not right on top. All right, we will. Yeah, I'm sure you were aware we were coming back to the antibody negative question because that'll be a big one. Gordon, uh, yeah, kind of this is, yes, I agree with everything Pushpa said. I, I would um, make a couple of additional points, and that is that um, uh, the the easy answer to your question, Steve, are that there is no one size fits all. It's a, you know this is an unpredictable disease, and um, and therefore, I, I think it's hard to say exactly where where these drugs will have their role. One area that I don't think Pushpa talked about is that of bridge therapy. Um, so, uh, for instance, steroid sparing agents take many months, six months to a year to work. Uh, and it's very easy to see how either of these agents would work pretty quickly and are, and are um, I would say, very effective for some patients. I, I, I don't think the discussion, to my mind, captured how effective these can be. And if you look at the, the positive end of the response in the clinical trials, I think it's very impressive. But it's easy to see a period of time where we use uh, either of these agents to bridge people towards uh, uh, a time where their steroid sparing agents are, are uh, effective. And this is something that many of us use IVIG for now. 
Uh, whether this would be either drug would be more effective than IVIG, I don't know, but there clearly are patients who don't respond. And I, I, de I definitely agree with uh, Pushpa that I think the role these drugs are likely to have beyond the bridging therapy uh, is really for patients who've been refractory to um, other drugs or having uh, a risk of side effects, which I really want to amplify. You know, steroids are, are, can be really hard for some patients. Many, if not most patients, were able to manage them. But um, you know, the ability to get people off steroids is, uh, is highly valued. And I don't think the uh, clinical trial data from BDMG or IVIG are um, informative in that way. Um, I think certainly our clinical practices, steroid sparing agents, and even using IVIG um, can be effective. And in fact, I, I, I think where one scenario that Pushpa was probably alluding to, where using uh, one of these drugs, and I'm trying to think about how to pronounce FGAR with a J, by the way, FGAR Jidamad, um, you know, uh, would be. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> the last time I joked that I got kicked off the Zoom. Uh, but I, I, I think of patients who have diabetes. So I, I am prone to put people on IVIG if they have significantly out of control diabetes while we're waiting for their steroid sparing agents to kick in. So okay. Yeah. That's good. So um, and now as I as we are kind of heading towards the, the coverage zone, and then we'll talk about pricing and, and, and research. Um, I just wanna frame this part of our policy discussion because um, again, we know that the evidence is still evolving. We know that what we know about uh, how to use it best for different patients is something that we'll learn more about after um, FGAR tijamad is, is, in, is in use. Um, we've had a couple of years of use of eculizumab what we then have is we have real world uh, evidence, if you will, or experience with how insurance coverage has covered um, eculizumab. And so part of the questions I'm gonna ask is, if we want to create a system that provides fair access to patients, even though we have said that, you know, we, the report and the panel have suggested that the price is too high for the benefits, it doesn't mean that patients shouldn't get fair access to it. So what we need to talk about is that everlasting tension when an insurer sits down to look at the clinical trial data, the FDA label, and has to write an insurance coverage policy and will factor in different things, including input from their own clinical experts, et cetera. So I'm going to ask a lot of rhetorical questions and questions about what if it's covered this way or that way. But the ultimate goal here is to share perspectives, including the patient perspective and clinical experts and everybody. Um, and obviously maybe not come up with the one right way to do it, but to make sure that as this information does flow to decision makers like insurers, that they are able to hear the different perspectives on the choices that they will face as they write their insurance coverage policy. So that's just the kind of where we're, where we're headed and why. So when an insurance company kind of sits down, I've got papers in front of me, by the way, that reflect the clinical trial eligibility criteria and I've got the FDA label for eculizumab. And I actually have a couple of snapshots of the coverage policies by some of our biggest um, insurers in the country. And as I mentioned, we have IPD Analytics and Primera here with us today. So let me start by asking a question about the antibodies. Go back to what Pushpa was talking about. So eculizumab was obviously tested in or trialed in patients who are antibody positive, And that's what all the coverage, all the coverage says antibody positive only. Um, FGAR is in a really gray zone, um, to be honest, because it had exploratory analyses that did not seem to show, according to the vote of our panel, that it looked like it was adequate evidence to say that it works for antibody negative. So one of my first questions is when the patient population is being defined for insurance coverage policy, um, what are the perspectives on whether insurers will or won't for FGAR weave in something about antibody positivity as a condition of coverage. Kim, is, maybe I can start with you because in a way I can ask you tough questions and it's you can diffuse that you know diffuse it over a bunch of different decision makers. But how do you think plans will be and PBMs will be thinking through that question, the antibody question? Yeah, I think it's going to be, I think it's pretty problematic that we have such limited data in the negative population. Um, and I think 
for that reason, this topic is going to be the one of the top topics that P&T committees kind of go through, pharmacy and the physician going back and forth. I think ultimately, though, if the label, um, if even if the label is broad, let's say, and doesn't specify antibody positive patients, I think it's a really easy decision for a payer to decide to exclude antibody negative patients because of that limited data um, and because of the cost of the drug. So um, that's kind of what I think is going to happen. Emily, I know, I mean, I can't remember actually whether you guys have already formalized, I mean, of course, you do have coverage for eculizumab. Nobody has coverage policy formalized yet for FGAR. So, and I'm not trying to pin you down to say exactly what you will or won't do, but how, just as Kim said, how will you guys weigh that tension if the FDA label does not specify antibody positive, um, knowing what you know about the evidence right now for that antibody negative subpopulation? Yeah, thank you for the question, Steve. So we're going to be looking at it in the next couple of months. And, you know, if PNT were to determine that treatment with FR mod for patients who test negative for those antibodies is not medically necessary, and yet, you know, the FDA approves it for this population, um, you know, I think another uh, perspective I would add to what Kim said is that it really depends on the patient's prior authorization process, um, which can vary a lot from payer to payer. Um, you know, and a lot of those processes, they can end in a peer-to-peer -peer call or a call with the prescriber, the patient, and the payer. Um, and the reason why I bring these up is because in these discussions, um, the FDA seal of approval is really such a powerful piece of the equation. And when a medical policy is not aligned with the FDA's approved indications, and that discussion between providers and maybe with the patient also um, happens, it oftentimes can focus less on the clinical evidence and more around the patient's right to try for clinical benefit with the treatment because it is FDA approved for them. So I, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, you know, ultimately, these decisions are made by our PNT committee and you know, our team implements the decisions of our committee and makes every effort to explain the committee's decision making to our provider partners and the patients we all serve. But, you know, the implementation of that, I think, really becomes challenging later on. Yeah. Um, Gordon or Pushpa, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, you had your own experience with insurers around eculizumab, obviously, which is specified for antibody positive. Do you try to argue with them that this is an antibody negative patient, but eculizumab is worth a try? Um, what, 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 what do we have to learn from the experience with eculizumab over the past couple of years? I, I kicked push with soundly in front of the bus last time, so I'll, I'll step up this time. I, I haven't done that with eculizumab, but um, we do it all the time with IVIG. And I, I want to part, point to Marsha's experience, right? I mean, we have a seronegative myasthenic patient here who told us that uh, she responds very well to plasmapheresis and then FGAR tijamod <laughs> is, uh, I, yeah, you know, I knew how to do it before I got here. Uh, is, is, uh, it's very, we think, similar mechanism of action to plasma exchange. And if you are a patient with seronegative myasthenia gravis, th th there isn't anything that clearly works for you in the evidence base, yet we know anecdotally that treatments targeting autoimmune myasthenia do. So I, I think in particular for FDAR, FDAR, I gosh darn it, I can't say it, FGAR, um, it, there's a logic, and I, I think having a uh, escalation pathway that allows for a peer to peer to have a discussion is something that I certainly, as a provider, would hope to have access to. And I bet Marsh is pretty enthusiastic about that uh, I am as well. Very enthusiastic about it, Gordon. Um, and so is my physician, who's very skilled. And um, she told me that she better start the paperwork now <laughs> so that I can get it when it's available. Um, can we give a little bit of meat on the bones to the peer-to-peer? -peer? I know this is an ancient uh, uh, touch point of, of, of difficulty because it, it's, you know, it's, it's not always easy for a payer to have a neuromuscular myasthenia gravis expert to be the person that you can talk to on the phone. They might have a general neurologist. Um, uh, they might not even have a neurologist sometimes. So there's a variable um, kind of connectivity on that. Um, but I think, would it be fair to say that as a general recommendation, given myasthenia gravis and it, it, its intricacies, that when we talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, 
we, we need the health plans and PBMs to have people who really know this clinical area. However, we want to label their expertise. Um, is, is there anything else you would add about what that looks like in reality, Gordon, Pushpa, or others? Well, you know, it's, I can tell you my first experience with Echolizumab. It was a couple of months maybe after it was approved. And um, I got, I was quite sure that my patient who was refractory would get approved. And lo and behold, of course, he got denied. So I called, um, you know, to speak to a clinician. And uh, I said, look, and uh, the gentleman was very nice. And he said to me, you know, I would have said, that's fine. I don't know anything about the drug. I would have said, fine. But all we have to go by is, uh, you know, the fact that it's not approved for myasthenia gravis. So I said, let me give you some news. It was actually approved in October 2017. So he said, oh, it's approved. Here's your authorization number. So, <laughs> so that was my first story. But um, I think uh, at the end of the day, you know, what Emily said uh, really is important. It's, it's that FDA mark of approval, that seal. Now I will back up. The, the question doesn't arise for echolizumab because echolizumab is not effective in non-acetylcholine receptor antibody positive mycena gravis. So the question doesn't arise regarding, um, because of its mechanism of action, so, uh, regarding asking for it. Uh, but it's going to be definitely a different story. And I also wonder whether one way that uh, insurers may take, may sort of look at this would be, uh, yes, uh, especially if the FDA gives it, gives it broad approval, which I have a feeling will happen, maybe to say, let's step it, you know? And I think that's reasonable. And I think that's reasonable. All right, we're gonna to come to the step in a second. Uh, step therapy has a bad name and we'll, we'll come back to, to how it could be applied here. Yeah, so um, I'm anticipating all your questions, I'm sorry. Yes, you are. No, that's, I know you, you, you've been down this road before. Um, before we move on, uh, I wanna talk about two quick things. Um, well, one quick probably and one not so quick. The quick thing is some insurers, when they define, I'm looking again at some insurance uh, kind of coverage here, they actually require something to document that it is myasthenia gravis. One, for instance, requires a history of abnormal neuromuscular transmission test uh, uh, and or a history of positive anticholinesterase test and or uh, I guess the patient has improved while on an oral cholinesterase inhibitor. Is something like that, is that appropriate for an insurer to require? Um, does that help us avoid some of the misdiagnosis if we're talking about very expensive treatments? Or are those kinds of sets of requirements uh, counterproductive in some way? Any thoughts on that? I guess a clinical expert would probably be first up for this one too. Would there be any harm in an insurer requiring one of those tick a box before uh, you would think of coverage for one of these two treatments? I think it's fairly standard for them to require this for many conditions, in, you know, especially the rarer conditions. Uh, so I think it's fairly standard and it can be a little difficult with seronegative myasthenia gravis because we obviously don't have the antibodies. Uh, we don't, uh, sometimes we can have trouble with electrodiagnostic testing in these patients. Uh, and uh, so we are left with a clinical diagnosis and, you know, hopefully response to an acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitor, clinical, good, robust clinical response to it. Uh, but it can also, as you said, be a double-edged sword in those patients, because if you don't require some certainty about the diagnosis, then, uh, you know, we are going to subject them to this treatment. So I think to sort of set that standard to require some degree of um, certainty that this is indeed myasthenia gravis is not a bad idea. Okay. So Steve, I think this is a really logical thing to do, but I'm not sure it's really effective. Uh, and I worry about the unintended consequences. Uh, I actually think overdiagnosis of myasthenia is fairly rampant. I mean, when patients referred into my clinic for myasthenia gravis, as often as not, they have something else. Uh, and uh, many of those patients are on chronic immunotherapy. And I've had to have lots of challenging discussions having, I've learned a lot of lessons in moving institutions and I've had to unwind therapy of patients who don't have myasthenia who pass through these hoops. Wow. And so that doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't use them, but uh, particularly when you get into seronegative myasthenia gravis, then the diagnostic 
um, um, algorithm gets into access to fairly sophisticated care. You need to have someone who's a neurophysiologist to do repetitive nerve stimulation or single fiber EMG, uh, which is a tough thing to do. The, you know, Jim Albers, who trained me, said you can, you can tell the quality of electromyographer by how they deal with myasthenia gravis. And so I worry that use of these sort of things makes us feel better, but I worry it may just be a placebo and the unintended consequence could be access to care and uh, I really, I truly believe there are significant care disparities in, in myasthenia. So I, I, I don't know. We think it probably makes sense, but no one's really studied it. All right. I actually, I was going to come back to centers of excellence later, and maybe I still will, because uh, I want to kind of keep plowing ahead on this. But that's, that, that's a very helpful perspective. Um, probably the more complicated issue was back to this idea of refractory. So a refractory is this general term, and we know that with eculizumab, they defined it, if you will, through their entry criteria for the trial. And looking at insurance companies, of course, what they did it felt was reasonable to say, these are the patients for whom the treatment has shown benefit. So we will use that language in our insurance coverage policy. Interestingly, there's still variation, even though it looks like that's what they were trying to do. Some, some There's slight tweaks to the way that they even took the eligibility criteria for eculizumab. And so I have two, two kind of questions. One is more broadly, FGAR was not tested in refractory, that, that is patients who have tried and failed a number of other treatments. They just have to be on at least one or more treatments prior to randomization. That's the only kind of clinical, along with being in certain classes of, of, uh, of the disease. So uh, maybe back to Emily and to, to Kim, the way that the payers are going to think, are they going to think, well, we know how we've been managing eculizumab and we've had it for refractory patients who've tried these other things. FGAR doesn't come with that part of its clinical trial eligibility criteria, but are we still going to do that for FGAR? Is the coverage going to require that they try, as with eculizumab, failure of at least two immunosuppressant agents or failure of immunosuppressant agent and plasma exchange or IVIG? Do we think that they're going to use that language from eculizumab and shop it over into FGAR? Kim, what do you think? Yeah, um, you're, you're right. I mean, currently you see such a range and we see, we see that generally with payers, just about how restrictive they want to be. So everyone kind of has this backbone of, you know, prior off to the FDA label, and then you just get more restrictive from there. Um, so I think, you know, the tendency is to take the ADAP trial and extrapolate it into criteria. Um, I think now, because there's going to be two, we're assuming it's going to be approved, right? So two approved drugs for myasthenia gravis that are in this like specialty disease state, very expensive. I think they're absolutely going to require at minimum that you've failed or had relapse on at least one of those therapies. Um, I, I do think it could be up to two. Um, I do not think, I know in some of the eculizumab policies currently, some very restrictive payers will require failure on chronic IVIG or rituximab. I don't think we'll see that because again, with two FDA approved therapies and because of the limited data that was spoken to earlier, I, I don't think that will be written in policies, but I do foresee them requiring one to two um, you know, immunosuppressant uh, therapies and trialing them for at least you know, a year. I, I can see that as being a, a very real possibility. Pushpa and Gordon, is the clinical community going to view that as reasonable or will it feel like it's not fair because the, the FDA label doesn't require this or doesn't call, you know, doesn't mention this and yet, nor does the clinical trial. We want to be able to use it in some cases for patients who haven't failed one to two. What's the reaction generally going to be? And um, Pushpa, you're very familiar, you both are, I'm sure, with the clinical guidelines. Is there anything specifically in there that would guide a payer to feel like they should or shouldn't march that requirement over from eculizumab into the coverage policy for FGAR? So when we developed the guidelines, it was just after ECU had been, at least the revised updated guidelines earlier, uh, late last year and published early this year. It was um, obviously just after the eculizumab approval process. So, and we were cautious at that time because we had really not much long-term data. So, uh, the sh and we did not address EPCAR at that time because it wasn't, uh, it was in studies. So no, maybe at the ne next iteration, three years, two years hence, I guess. Uh, so short answer is no. They, uh, to, 
sort of answer your, the other part of your question and Gordon, um, uh, you may feel differently, but I think um, I would be uncomfortable. I mean, especially in instances uh, that Gordon mentioned earlier, rescue therapy. And there have been, as Gordon said, there have been instances where we've used, uh, I have not, but some colleagues have used eculizumab in crisis situation just because of that uh, a rapidity of action. So to say no, you know, they've got to take something and have the side effects to it or fail it. Uh, uh, when, you know, as I said earlier, and um, I think Gordon, you alluded to it, to it the, the single patient who I'm starting AQS first line is an older woman with multiple comorbidities. And I'm terrified of putting her on steroids, frankly. So in, uh, and uh, I cannot wait for her to, uh, for for mycophenolate to kick in. I'm worried about renal insufficiency with IVIG, multiple multitude of factors. To be told in that patient that I cannot have access to this drug would be a problem. So I think really, you know, that 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 uh, should should not uh, sort of prevent me from using it in a clinical situation because again, these are powerful drugs, uh, drugs that have great effect. And to tell me that just because it was studied there and because of a money issue, I'm not going to pay it, pay for it at the outset would be a problem. Yeah, I think um, uh, in reflecting on what Pushpa said, I bet everyone thinks their disease is special. Right, uh, I take care of myasthenia, and it's unique. But here, I, I think it truly is. I mean, it is a complicated disease to take care of. It's unpredictable. There are these nuances in terms of uh, of transitioning people to get onto long term immunosuppressant agents, management of acute crisis, and so I think we it would be optimal to think about a, a strategy that. Uh, facilitates flexibility appropriately. You mentioned centers of excellence, which I guess we'll talk about momentarily, but um, I agree with Push, but I think that these may sound like uncommon problems, but in the patient population I serve here in downtown Richmond, they're incredibly common. No one just has myasthenia. They've got myasthenia and a, a bevy of other things. And the situation where we say, you know, we're not going to use steroids because of the, the, the risk to your health, that, that's a common occurrence. Well, I foresee storm clouds on the horizon. Um, we'll, we'll make note of it. But I was talking about insurers potentially using criteria from eculizumab and bringing it into FGAR. But it is absolutely the norm for them to take the clinical trial of the drug itself and make that the cornerstone, as Kim said, of their policies. And then they, as she said, they go down from there. Not always, but. And I was looking at FGAR's clinical trial eligibility, and they had to be on steroids for at least three months with no dose change for one month. And that was to get into that trial. So in a sense, the lowest bar for an insurer is to use that clinical trial eligibility in their coverage policy. And then again, there's that option of they're bringing over some of the stuff from eculizumab. Um, just, just to note, interestingly, one of the biggest insurers in the country for eculizumab um, requires the, you know, the, the failure, and we, we always want to be careful that we're talking about the failure of the drug, not of the patient on the drug, the failure of the drug of two immunosuppressants, and they had to have two or more courses of plasma exchange, and at least 12 months of IVIG without symptom control. So, that is so they basically added all the criteria. That's correct. So they changed some ors to ands, and they gave some 12 months, which is kind of a little bit out. You know, sometimes they, they do have to come up with some hard edges to be able to administer an insurance policy. There's no doubt about it. But uh, again, I'm just kind of highlighting that in this process of looking at the FDA label, which is sometimes broad and even ill-defined, the clinical trial eligibility criteria and what the insurance coverage there's, there's this really interesting kind of flow from one to the other. And that's what we're trying to highlight here, the perspectives on, is it, is it reasonable to include all of the clinical trial eligibility criteria for FGAR, for instance, in the coverage policy, even if the FDA label doesn't mention it? I, no, I will, I, I, uh, sorry. Sorry, um, I didn't oh, mean no. to interrupt, go. So I, I do think, uh, you know, we need to 
pay attention to the fact here that this can be dangerous. This, this thing of requiring plasma exchange for somebody, plasma exchange is an invasive procedure with its own risks. And to tell me that I have to actually give somebody two rounds of plasma exchange, it doesn't say whether it's one exchange or a whole course. Whole course is 10 exchange, five exchanges over 10 days to put that line in and to give it to them or then to say, otherwise find a contraindication for it or find a contraindication for IVIG, that's crazy. All right, hold on. I need to back, I need to back up because I did miss one of my own ands and ors. They have to have the failure of two and either two or more courses of plasma phoresis, plasma exchange, and or 12 months of IVIG without symptom control. So it's so it, they don't have to have plasma phoresis. But th this was the most complicated one that I saw, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to draw it draw it out. So yeah, can I, I take a swing at that? Yeah, yeah I think that's. Swing at that's that and then, and then, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, I'd love to take a swing at it. That, that that's it's insanity, and I, I I'll point out that uh, you don't need a year on IVIG to figure out whether it's going to work. I mean that that's a that's a policy that's no that policy is a no. Right, um, that's, uh, you know, for so many reasons. And I, I really want to echo push upon plasma exchange. I, um, um, you know, it's very rare that we need to use chronic plasma exchange um, in, in patients with myasthenia or for that matter, plasma exchange outside of the setting of a crisis. So to require plasma exchange in a non-crisis situation before accessing echolizabab, I think is intrinsically dangerous for patients because if they respond, and that's all they respond to, you're going to continue them on that. And it's extremely difficult for patients. Uh, you end up with requiring dialysis, fistulas, and all kinds of things. So I, I think that's a policy that I would, uh, I don't know, I guess I'd have a, you know, a, a collaborative conversation with the payer about that one. All right, yeah. we're gonna, we're gonna um, that one. I want, I want to move on just because I want to make sure I notice it's now three o'clock and I have, we have I need to correct one thing you said, actually. Um, oh, okay. Patients weren't required to be on steroids in our trial. If they were on steroids, they were required to be stable. That's, but, but they, they weren't, by no means were all of the patients in our trial on steroids. I'm sorry. Thank That's you, correct. Glenn, because yeah. it said it had to be on greater than one, yeah. greater than or equal to one of the following. So steroids correct. was one of the possibilities. They didn't right. have to be on steroids. Right. Thank you. So if they, if, they, if they don't, if the insurers don't make the same mistake that I just did, they will include that one of the following um, and it would not require that they be on steroids. It would just require acetylcholinesterase inhibitors uh, with no dose change for two weeks or steroids for three months or another nonspecific, um, you know, uh, with NSIT, sorry, non-steroid <laughs> um, uh, immunosuppressant therapy of at least six months. So those would be the ORs within that coverage policy. Okay. Right. I want to move then to I'm an insurer, and um, I know that one size doesn't fit all, but that doesn't mean that I can't ask them to take the cheaper one first if it's a coin flip on which one would work best for the patient. So I've got FGAR and eculizumab, and let's assume that FGAR is less expensive. Would it be reasonable or unreasonable for an insurer to say to a neurologist, please use FGAR first, and if it doesn't work, then you can come back and use ecul eculizumab later? Would that make clinical sense 50% of the time, 90% of the time, 99% of the time? Would it be reasonable to try FGAR first? I don't think we know. Uh, of course, this would only apply to the acetylcholine receptor antibody patients. Right. And I honestly don't think we know. I, if we I don't have to... know, if we, right, so if we don't know, that's an insurer, I'm, I'm playing the role of the insurer here. Sure. If we don't know, and I can save the system $100,000 or more, should we not try the less expensive agent first? Or is there, any, is there any harm in trying it if they can then pivot to the other one if they don't receive adequate uh, kind of response in a certain amount of time? So I think uh, I'd be happier knowing some long-term results with uh, FGAR to be able to discuss that. Uh, in terms, uh, basically in terms of safety and in terms of sustained benefit. So I think that would be a good thing to know before I decided that. And then, you know, honestly, I don't know what decision I would make. I think it would depend on convenience and other factors. Okay, let me turn to Glenn then. Yeah, so, right. Right. Gordon, let me go to Glenn just for a sec. Okay. 
Glenn, you're, I think it's CFO, COO, somewhere out there said, again, we're gonna be pricing higher than IVIG and lower than Eculizumab. So how would you feel about, our, is part of your business model to be less expensive so that you would want payers to prefer your drug in a specific way over Eculizumab for patients for whom both are a reasonable clinical option? Um, so what I would say is um, that's a big range is the first thing I would note, right? Uh, the difference uh, between IVIG and, <laughs> and Acuprice is a very, very broad range. In terms of uh, our stance on that, I mean, you know, we believe in, in appropriate access. And so what I think is that what the clinicians, how they need to use and how they need to prescribe is between them and their patients. Uh, I don't think that we're pricing with an idea in mind that, uh, oh, we'll get in front of ECU. That's, I don't think that's part of our equation. Uh, well, I would actually say, I bet a lot of the employers and patients out there wouldn't mind a little competition that felt like if you go with a lower price, um, you might get some more business. Emily, how are you gonna view that kind of equation? If you hear from your clinical experts that both treatments could be used uh, for, for, the, for the antibody positive patients, are you going to consider stepping them through the less expensive agent? What do you think? Yeah, Steve, I think I can pretty much guarantee that it'll be discussed, but you know, I think every payer is different in terms of their willingness to go right out of the bat and kind of make that decision. Um, you know, I'm speaking from our, my historical perspective from our committee. Um, we may not be one of the pairs who do that, but I think that there may potentially be some that will. And this is one of my favorite questions. Thank you, Emily. One of my favorite questions for IPD analytics is, okay, there are 100% of payers out there. What percent do you think would do that? I think right out of the gate, it would be very limited. Truly, I think like 10%, if that, um, to piggyback on what Emily said, um, we've had a lot of novel treatments approved for other disease states over the past one to two years at some pretty high price tags. And there's nothing directly comparable, um, but they're close enough that you could maybe consider step therapy. And what I see is that payers are not stepping them right now. I think um, to the clinical experts point, you need a little bit more long-term data to be able to compare them and then make that decision. So I don't think right off the gate, they'll step it, but maybe two years, we have some more long-term data, real world data, a study comes out, then that may be an opportunity. All right. So let me move on then, if I may, to the uh, dosing issues around Fgartigimod, because there's so much richness in the uncertainty around how the drug will be labeled, how it will be used, and how insurers will cover it. Those are all huge questions right now. Um, Glenn, I know you, I mean, you have to be careful for multiple reasons before your label comes out, but um, there was a dosing protocol used for the pivotal trial. What do you think the FDA is going to be doing when it thinks about whether that dosing becomes part of the label? Um, do you think it is, it, it does, it's kind of cut and pasted as part of the label? And then we'll talk about what insurers would do with that kind of information, much less clinicians. But what is your general view of how the FDA would view how important the dosing was to the relative benefits and side effects of this treatment? Yeah, um, it's a fair question. And, you know, we recognize that, that the approach used was, was for an individualized dosing regimen. Um, and it really was developed based on input from patients. You know, we heard that they wanted to not necessarily need an infusion every week. Um, it is part of the trial. Our experience is that typically elements like that that are used in a trial do are, are used by the FDA as they shape the label. We of course don't know what the exact inclusion is going to look like in terms of dosing yet, um, but, but we expect some reflection of that based on how it was used in the trial. Further, we actually think that um, in this space, it's been mentioned, it, you know, there's an existing treatment that is used in a similar way. And we think that the docs who are familiar with that will be more comfortable with it. Um, and, and it does allow the patients really to get what they need. Okay. So let me, as I <clears throat> head towards the payers, let me go through the clinical experts next. So 
I'm assuming you guys would like to be able to use FGAR and tailor it to the individual patient. Some you want to do it four on, four off, more you might just do four, and then I forget what percent got that sustained benefit up to 12 weeks, and so it would look different for them. <clears throat> for some, you might find that, oops, if I wait two weeks, they, their symptoms come right back up, so they're going to be more like an every week or an every other week. Is there any, I mean, assuming again that the FDA label may say something about the dosing protocol from the clinical trial, um, how, how do you see it playing out in clinical practice? Well, I, I've already commented on this. I think that there's a, a strong similarity with how we use IVIG where, uh, and not only for myasthenia, but for other disorders, where we'll start off with a, you know, fairly standard um, regimen of uh, a particular uh, dosing um, a regimen um, and uh, frequency, and then um, determine the clinical efficacy and, and, and try to uh, optimize therapy at the lowest possible dose. And I think that um, I predict that with flexibility, you'll see a, all kinds of sort of real world innovation regarding, and then you pointed out several things. Is it four weeks and you repeat in 12? Is it every other week? Um, and uh, I, I think from a patient perspective, this is valuable because it's hard to come in and get an infusion or to get a home infusion every week. I, you know, I, one of our patients commented on that. That's tough. Um, and so I, I, and I, and I think neurologists who care for myasthenia or other autoimmune neuromuscular diseases are very comfortable with the idea of adjusting dosing frequency based on, um, on patient response. And we've heard multiple examples. Uh, we, we heard about it with the dosing of rituximab, not using the, you know, the standard four treatments uh, every so often, but just a one gram treatment. Uh, I think we'll see the same thing here. So let me then swing over to the insurers um, because Again, there's this mixed feeling that I'm assuming that many insurers will have to the idea of the art of the one patient tailored treatment with something that's very expensive because that sounds perfect and exactly what we would all want in, in many ways, but it opens up some door for clinicians to overuse it perhaps beyond the protocol and the trial or beyond what other clinicians might view as, as reasonable. Maybe they need to try some time off, uh, and most clinicians would do that, but for whatever reason, this one clinician just likes to use it every week. Um, how do you think payers are going to address this? Are they going to have some set duration of therapy and then check back with the doctor to see what the thoughts are on what the appropriate dosing will be there forth or henceforth, or will they make some kind of maximum use? Will they say maximum 12 doses in three months in some way? Because that, in one of these insurers, again, they did that with eculizumab. They said up to a maximum of 1200 milligrams every two weeks. And I have no idea if any reasonable clinician would ever want to use it more than that, but it's possible that insurers will think about creating some kind of dosing limit or maximum doses in a set amount of time. So uh, maybe I'll start with Kim first this time. Kim, do you, have you looked into that issue? Have you thought about that issue of whether that could be part of the coverage policy for FGAR when it comes through? Yeah, um, I think it's a great question. So I think that at a minimum, I think you could see people putting limits on it, but nothing restrictive. I think just like you said, a reasonable limit that no one would really um, exceed. Um, I think an interesting point here though with the dosing is that there is an opportunity here for payers to do kind of like an extended interval dose optimization type of a thing. And um, there are programs right now with tocalizumab and rheumatoid arthritis that do this, where if a patient is stable on every four week dosing, we move them to every five, and then we move them to every six. And as soon as you see some kind of disease relapse, you go back to the previous dosing interval. And I think that's something that could potentially be seen here. And it really ends up being a win-win for the patient because they're not having to come in as often potentially. And then also for the insurer, because, you know, best case scenario, we're, we're being more cost effective by stretching out the interval. So um, I think that's something that we could see. That driven by the insurer. So the patient and the doctor are happy with every four, but the insurer knocks on the door and says, I want you to try every five. Yeah, I will say it's more, it's easier when you have a, um, 
uh, an integrated like health plan, yeah. right? That that's like best case scenario. So I think in those situations, you could see something like that. Yeah. Okay. Emily, what does that make you think of? Just the general idea of how the dosing maximum average, how do you think you guys are gonna approach that? Any idea? Yeah, you know, um, I think what Kim said is very reasonable. Um, you know, I think the only thing I would add is that particularly on the medical benefit, prior authorization, in my opinion, is a pretty blunt tool. Um, and it's really, you know, you, you may go in with a certain intent, but, you know, the ability to operationalize that is, is challenging. Um, and I think that's potentially why you see some payers not having a quantity limit on um, Echolizumab, for example. Um, you know, the operational aspect of that is not, uh, and oftentimes not ideal. And so uh, that, that's another point I would point out. Um, but I think um, everything that Kim said is very, it makes sense to me. Okay. Um, I want to add one point here about uh, yes, payers. So, uh, like the, uh, some of, we've seen in some of the MS drugs, I anticipate that payers will need proof of response. And I anticipate that more people will be doing the MGADL and looking for minimum symptom expression or change here. So I think that that's one point. So I think they will use that as a criterion. And I think that's reasonable. Um, I think it also uh, comes back to this uh, fear that we'll use it more than every every four weeks or a four week course and then wait for about eight weeks, which is one cycle. Um, right. That would be difficult, I think, because then we are sort of saying we are not, we are not, the patient is not responding and that's not what the trial showed. You know, the responder was the folks in that one cycle and then give second, a second cycle. You may say, well, try two cycles or three cycles, but I don't think, uh, you know, there would be, uh, I don't think so, but then, you know, you never know. Well, I certainly foresee a, a huge need for good real world evidence on differential dosing regimens for patients, even N of one trials here. I mean, again, given that it's a relatively limited patient and clinician expert community, it would be great to have some kind of registry of dosing trials at an N of one label, uh, N, N of one level, because patients might well want to be part of that so that they could also minimize, you know, their, as you said, being tethered into the medical center. So I think that's a good point. Um, I do want Steve, to I wonder if Glenn, uh, so Sorry. I think our genetics is gathering data around this or planning. I mean, you, Glenn, okay. you can speak to this, I think, but there is a My Real World uh, MG tool. And I would imagine after launch, the company is going to be gathering those data. Yeah, I mean, we have several ongoing data efforts. The My Real World effort is, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, and um, it it won't be translated exactly into this, but we are developing other tools to help uh, clinicians to gather the information uh, about you know, the length of response and, and what's happening with patients. I mean, this is something that of course is integral for us to understand as the drug rolls out. Um, we all know the real world uh, is, is, uh, is different. And so understanding how patients respond and the length of response is something that I think will benefit us, the clinicians and the payers, frankly. Great. All right. I want to pivot to talk a bit about the price um, and then we'll circle back on some research issues. And I do want to hear again from the patients to make sure that we haven't missed anything important on the coverage side, but I think I've covered most of the bases. Um, in addition to the centers of excellence, I still have to come back to that too. But um, so Glenn, thank you again, as David Rin said, our chief medical officer for the engagement of, of your company throughout the process. And for, I thought, some very uh, well thought uh, comments you made earlier too. So you and I see differently on this issue, obviously, about how we think about what a fair price would be. Because we've seen rare diseases again, and we, we, I, sir, I am very sensitive to the history and why that seems to set a pricing level in people's minds about what's fair or reasonable. And so just to rerun the clock as I understand it, so IVIG is, is difficult to obtain and to kind of the market for it is different because it's a human product. And so there's a kind of a reason, if you will, that it's very expensive because of the difficulty of obtaining it at scale. Um, and, and as you know, eculizumab through the years has been a poster child for what's been viewed as egregious pricing um, by many people. So you've got these two very high price points in a way. And I understand the historical rationale of saying we could see IVIG as a floor and 
eculizumab as a, as a ceiling and be somewhere in there and be reasonable. But as I understand it, FGAR is not that expensive to make. Um, and uh, at least not, not near to what IVIG is in terms of its procurement. So I'm just wondering how you think about, again, about justifying the price. And um, let me just throw in a curveball, which is indication specific pricing. Because you guys, I think, you know, we talked also about this being an orphan condition, but if I'm not mistaken, you guys will in relatively short order be going for broader indications that will very soon take the patient population beyond the orphan level in the US. So, and this has also been kind of talked about as a pattern in which a drug will get priced and approved for an orphan or ultra rare condition. And everybody kind of says, well, it's really expensive, but we're kind of used to it in that zone. Um, but then its use broadens and the price doesn't come down. So I guess I'm asking two questions, probably because we don't have that much time left. <laughs> sure. But one is another reflection on, could the pricing have been lower? Was it really necessary to price it above IVIG? And um, is there a prospect for, for indication-specific pricing that would be healthy for innovation, that would send the right signals that we can price differentially depending on the population size and on the relative benefits to patients. So the first thing I'll say is we're not priced yet. Um, and, um, but, but what I would say, I actually wanna answer your second question first. And, and that was, I think this has been an issue actually specifically with this review, not necessarily for us, but for the more expensive treatment in this space um, because they weren't priced really in MG initially. And I, I think it's an opportunity to talk about. I think indication-specific pricing is something we, we desperately need to figure out. Um, and, and right now, there's I can't identify a way to make it work. Uh, the way the system works, um, we've seen it happen before. If you, have, if you try it, a lot of times people simply get diagnosed differently or people recognize that it's different and they start switching how people, what, what's being used. So I think, I think it's definitely something we need more work to understand and to work out how do we make this, this work. Um, in terms of how we're priced, um, and, and you, you know this well, I mean, the price of the drug is not based on the cost of goods that comes right. in the bag. Um, right. It's based on what it took to get there to understanding what, what that drug can do and to continue doing that for other populations. To be clear, every population we're studying is a rare disease. Um, we're not going into a, a larger market. Um, each one is a rare disease. Now, if you add them all up, of course, you end up with more patients. Uh, and so I think it depends a bit on how we're describing that. Um, but, but I mean, right now we have to worry about where we're at and what the future brings. I mean, we have to make sure that our, our, our pricing is consistent as we move through those. And the indication specific piece is definitely something we have to attend to. Another piece that, that didn't come up, but uh, our dosing in the trials for the other conditions is quite different. And, and so in terms of, we, we do have a condition that's being dosed weekly um, and understanding. And so in terms of safety issues, we've not seen a lot there, but for us being able to comprehend and understand how we work out pricing across different conditions is definitely a piece of it. And it goes back to if we had a way to approach indication specific pricing, we would definitely be interested in understanding how to get there with you. Thank you. I mean, you, I completely agree. Indication specific pricing is a bit of a, it's a tough nut. Um, we actually have a long white paper on it and the length I think <laughs> speaks how difficult a topic it is. Yeah. Um, the best examples we've seen are when the company is just decides what the heck we're going to completely rebrand it. We're going to take yeah. the same molecule and say it's X drug for lung problems and Y drugs for erectile dysfunction. And it's the same chemical, but it's a completely different market strategy, et cetera. And I know that that may not be that feasible for a smaller company with its first drug, that kind of thing. Um, another linked question that I was curious, did you guys ever think about the idea of, of because you don't know how many doses are going to be used and payers are going to have an incentive to get the patient outcomes at the lowest possible dose. Did you ever think of, of having a set price for a payer that we will well, we'll price it at X, but if the use of the drug exceeds, you know, a certain cap at that point, we'll give you a bigger rebate 
so that you have some certainty that it's not going to be a whole lot more budget impact for you over a year. And maybe that way you can actually lighten up on managing the dosing case by case, because you know that if the doctor does end up using a whole lot more of it, then you're kind of protected. Has that conversation ever come up? It's come up not only internally, but it is something that we've, we've talked with people outside about as well to understand, is there a way that we can, can relieve some of the concerns and pressures around that, that might come with this kind of individualized dosing? I mean, it's certainly something, and I think it behooves us to do that. Uh, it, it would be bad. It would be a pretty bad situation for us to come out with a, we expect this many infusions a year and the minute somebody hits two times that, we see it even as an egregious pricing. And so uh, certainly it's, a, it's an area of conversation internally and for us work being done significantly to understand what's the right way to get there. Good, good. I, I, I think that kind of innovation is something that the system would benefit, patients would benefit from. And again, as, especially if it leads to less tight reins on the clinical practice uh, aspects of how doctors can use it, it might be a win-win-win. So um, we'll, we'll mention it in our policy recommendations as a fruitful area for, for further consideration. And um, I'm glad to hear that you guys have already had some conversations. All right, in about five minutes, I wanna make sure we capture a few other thoughts on future research priorities. Um, we certainly have talked about ways that we might use N of one trials or other approaches to finding out how we can learn more about dosing and uh, kind of those pullback or extension, I don't know even what to call them, kinds of studies. Um, I also heard from the team that they were very aware of the indirect burdens of myasthenia gravis, and we heard about it from, you know, from Marsha and from Madrija, you know, the spillover effects, and yet, as often happens, we don't really have a lot of data on it. So um, are there any thoughts on ways we can do a better job of capturing those indirect as well as the health benefits of, of, of treatment for patients with MG. Is this something that industry and the patient community could partner on in some way? I, I, it's, it's hard because it doesn't go into the FDA label, but it'd be great to have some better evidence on, on how these treatments can help uh, you know, kind of patients and families in a broader sense. Glenn, maybe I can start with you. Any thoughts on the ability to weave that into your future data collection. It can't be part of real of standard real world because it's not going to be captured in claims. It's got to have to be some kind of survey effort. Yeah, I, and I, I mean, it's certainly something we've talked significantly internally about how do we get that data. I think part of the my real world effort I've mentioned before is understanding the caregiver impact. And as we move into having a treatment in the marketplace, we definitely want to understand you know, where do we have a positive effect on that? I mentioned earlier, we're trying to understand the full value of not only the drug, but the services that we're going to offer this, this patient population, which I think will be somewhat unique given most of the treatments are off label. And we wanna understand the full value of what we offer. And I think that's the full value to not only the patient, but their loved ones and their caregivers, families. Okay, I, you said that very, very well. I would just think it'd be great if help to make that more of a standard, even, even for new, you know, newer companies as they come through. We all need to try to create a, a, a landscape in which it's the norm to gather that kind of, of evidence, even if it takes a little bit more effort um, and, and even a little bit more money to get. Okay, I do want to now actually shift to your ability, each of you to have a kind of concluding comment. Um, uh, and I know that we haven't been able to, I haven't had a chance to circle back to centers of excellence. We'll have to put something in there about that, but I didn't want to lose the chance to do this before we moved on to the CPAC's closing comments. So what we'd like to do is to um, uh, allow each of you to, to kind of, again, say something. And we really do ask that if you can keep it to one sentence. <laughs> and the reason is we want it to be the one sentence that reflects the most important message you want to have taken home by the report and by the folks watching today. Sometimes that one sentence is a question or a request. The question could be to anybody, but the request could be to any other stakeholder. If you could say, if I could ask for one thing to make you know, the future better for patients and for innovation and affordability, pick, your, you know, pick whatever you wanna focus on. I would ask insurers to do this, or I would ask clinicians to do that, or I would ask the manufacturers to do something else. So feel free to, if you wish, to frame your final comment as that kind of request of, of somebody in the system. 
and we'll finish up with the patients at the end so they can have the final word. But why don't I start if I may with you, Glenn? Do you mind if I start with you? Um, what would be your final takeaway for us? Um, I think my final takeaway would, way would be I look forward to say a year from now, having another discussion after we have more real world data and people know more about how the drug is really going to be working in the environment. Fair enough, thank you very much. All right, Emily, can I turn to you next? Yeah, I would say that, you know, I, I really look forward to looking for creative ways to lower prices for certain patients. I think that, um, you know, when you, when you put all the heads together, you can come up with something that gets to the end solution. Great, thank you. Uh, Kim. I agree with Emily. I wanna say that I think that, you know, while we will see a large range of policies varying in their restrictions, I do think at the end of the day, this is a pretty small patient population. And so I do think there's opportunity for us to have a lot of peer to peer discussions, kind of tumor board like um, discussions. And so I do think that that's something we will see. Great, thank you. Gordon. Uh, I'll give I'll give it one word, which is excitement. Um, uh, I'm incredibly excited about the um, the efficacy of these agents and the impact they're going to have on patients' lives, and I'm equally excited about the uh, discussion that we just had around innovative pricing because we have to figure out a way of making this um, you know cost effective and valuable for our patients in larger society. And it's great to hear. Uh, industry willing to engage in conversations with uh, with your team about how to approach that. Right. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, Pushpa. Yeah, I just think this is groundbreaking uh, advances for patients with myasthenia, and I'm so excited to be practicing um, at a time like this. Um, I do think that with the uh, with your role, ICER and CPAC, and the role of such organizations. Uh, many of the questions that we've asked today will hopefully have answers over the next year or so, maybe with lots of observational studies. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, patients, thank you for being patient and, um, and for being experts and for being with us and, and really sharing both personal and kind of broader policy perspectives with us. So Adrija, do you mind if I ask you to go next? Sure, thank you. Uh, I would say to the insurers that the proof, the evidential area proof uh, necessary for the definition of medically necessary treatment needs to be um, more flexible and more diverse across the board. Um, and it is a matter of life and death for us. So. Great, thank you. And Marsha. Marsha, you still there? Oh, you're actually muted again. Sorry. Um, it was a brilliant, I bet, brilliant sentence. I'm just, I know, it was wonderful. And I started out with being muted and now finished with being. <laughs> um, it's the most exciting time in my life for my senior gravis because um, when I got diagnosed, Dr. Osserman, who was the father of my senior gravis, um, said to my parents, we're going to have her cured in 10 years. Well, that didn't happen. Um, but I think we have some real options for having a full life right now, as long as everyone has access to it. Um, you know, it's, I, I hope that, that the drugs are priced fairly and insurance companies will look upon them um, with um, the aid to help people live normal lives. So thank you for having this discussion. Oh, you're so welcome. Well, and you'll probably hear thank yous from members of the CPAC as well as we start to go around. But from me uh, and the entire ICER team, I want to thank each of you for the contributions, not just today, but for many of you throughout the course of this review. Um, I will note that if you've ever been uh, you know, to an insurance company, a health insurance company, as they wrestle with these decisions and with these coverage policies, um, they really do benefit from hearing these kinds of perspectives. And so we try really hard. It goes into our final policy recommendations. It's reflected on the online content where payers often go to see our work um, and they can get curated videos of this policy session. And I have heard from many payers that this is a piece that they just find that they can't replicate. They don't have the bandwidth to pull together the people and to have this kind of conversation. So I think we have, uh, I think, 
added a lot of depth to the understanding around the clinical and the patient and the broader perspectives um, in, this, in this area. And um, you're right, this will be moving fast and maybe we'll have more treatments. We'll certainly know more about these treatments um, in a year and it'll be, it'll be interesting to revisit. So with that, I'd like to thank you again and turn it over to um, Jason Waspy, who as chair of CPAC, I'd like to let him go around um, the CPAC and let them make their final comments. Um, and then I might have a final word at, at the very end. Um, but for again, for members of the Policy Roundtable, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome to stay and hear the, the sign out comments from the CPAC as well. Jason? Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I will just go through the, 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 the list uh, alphabetically for those who are here. Um, so if I could start with Megan Golden. Uh, yes. Oops, there I am. Uh, well, just thank you, everybody, um, for the analysis and especially to the patient representatives uh, for sharing your stories and the importance of the perspective. Um, I think this, you know, there's a lot of complicated issues in the way we, our healthcare system deals with these things, but fundamentally, it's very exciting to have new treatments for people who need them. So thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Martha Gold. Thank you again to, to all the panelists and the patients for, for making me a lot more <laughs> educated about myasthenia gravis and the, the disease itself and its process. Uh, this is a sort of a more general statement, I guess. I, I'm sort of reflecting on the absence of information about um, you know, the prevalence and the uh, subgroups of people that particular illnesses affect. And I, I, this is a wish that we knew more uh, for all kinds of illnesses about uh, who bears the greatest burden. Because if we're going to work to um, have health equity in the country, I think we need to sometimes think about where we're gonna prioritize resources. So I guess uh, both of the clinical trials piece and, and the discussions um, from NIH for all these years about having representative numbers of people who are affected by an illness in the trials, but also knowing about the prevalence. That, that seems very important to me. Thank you all. Thank you. And uh, Rebecca Kirsch. I'll echo the chorus in thanks for the comprehensive input and insights that the patients shared from the patient caregiver perspective. I carry that voice as well, but really appreciate the real world experience and the vulnerability that you all shared with us today and the thoughtful discussion of the whole group. Thank you, uh, Dr. Steve Kogan. Yeah, my thanks to the, um, certainly the patient um, advocates, such eloquent spokeswomen, and um, everything you said was very compelling. Thanks so much. Um, one of the things I took from today was um, really, I guess, being a little dismayed about evidence-based medicine. You know, not only the you know, new therapies we were thinking about, but it was surprising to learn how little is known about the efficacy of IVIG and uh, even some controversy around rituximab, you know, in this clinical condition. So, um, I guess we're doing the right thing and demanding evidence and, um, you know, just the need for that evidence to support clinical decision making is still so pervasive. Um, thanks to all. Um, th thanks, Steve. Uh, Dr. Uh, or Don Crace. Hey. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you, especially to all of the patient representatives. I learned a lot today. Uh, as I said when I introduced myself this morning, I come to this work via the cystic fibrosis community. So therefore, I know a lot about a disease that, like myasthenia, is an orphan disease, but unlike myasthenia, primarily afflicts white people and has been the beneficiary of a huge investment of both public and private funds that have gone a long way toward curing the disease. And, and in that capacity, I must say, I was really struck by the testimony I heard from Mr. Kimball and Ms. Huff and Ms. Boyd about the impacts of this disease on African-American people. And I don't think we have, as an ICER universe, given those folks uh, the kind of good answer that they deserve 
because what we said to them is that we don't have the data to determine what effect uh, this disease is having on the African-American community and what effect these drugs could have. And I know, even though I'm not a, a statistician or an economist, I do know that no data doesn't mean that you just put zeros in and assume zero is the correct number. I think maybe one answer would be to create, a, just as we compute the equal value life year gained of various treatments, maybe there should be an equal value Black Lives Matter life year gained that applies a utility value that's unique to the African-American community. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate today. I'm, I'm grateful to have witnessed all of this insight. Uh, th thank you, uh, Dr. Lavelle. Yeah, thanks everyone for a great discussion. Um, I guess my rec my one recommendation, and I'll try to keep this short, um, like just to echo what Steve said at the very end, I think if I had one recommendation going forward, it would be to collect data on the societal outcomes of this disease, because without having that information, we really are not able to come up with a value-based price. And, and, and that data can go a long way in um, arguing that, you know, what the fair price should be. So that would be my one recommendation for something really important going forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lowe. I'm, I'm just pained by the brutality of math. Uh, there's just no two ways about it. The math sometimes feels inhuman. And, and uh, I just want to give all the patients a hug, which we can't do during COVID and distant. But um, it, it, these prices are really painful. And they, they cause real problems. And, and uh, I don't know. I'm just waxing poetic about that. So apologies that I have no greater insight. <laughs> um, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, so this is my first opportunity to, uh, to participate as a CPAC member. So I, again, want to thank uh, everyone else to, for putting the report together, especially uh, the patients and echo what everyone else said. Uh, it's a real struggle to have to balance you know, the, societal, uh, the societal gain and benefit against, um, against the individual. Um, I think the thing that kept coming to my mind throughout this is how it's like almost an unfair expectation to try and put the um, like the burden of reversing societal inequities on on a single drug, uh, it's great if it if it can do that. But I just I kept feeling like these are these are kind of policy prescriptions. We need these are things that we reverse through through policy. It's hard to for a medicine a single drug to reverse that within such an unequal system. And I don't know. It's it's um yeah it's it's a challenging thing. I want those problems to be fixed and. Um, and I hope that these drugs will be able to help do that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sullivan. Hi, <clears throat> the problem with being last on the list is everyone's already said everything that I was thinking, but um, absolutely wanna thank everyone uh, taking part. Obviously the patients primarily, but, but everyone just contributed a, a great deal and that was wonderful. Um, I got involved with ICER because of my involvement with cystic fibrosis also like Don and um, uh, the pricing of some of the drugs there, which I got to tell you, in CF, we've seen a drug that's just made an incredible difference for our patients and, and really is tantamount to a cure. Um, and so I hope that the uh, myasthenia uh, community gets to, to experience that soon, too, because it really does make a, a huge difference for our patients. Um, but I just want to stress what everyone else has, the importance of social justice and the need for fair pricing. And that's certainly true for the CF drugs, too. But fair pricing that will assure access for everybody because to come up with a cure-like drug, and I'm not saying these are, but, but if they can come up with a cure-like drug, but for people not to be able to get it or our society not to be able to afford it for every single uh, orphan disease out there is just not going to make it worthwhile. So uh, fair pricing and, and access are key. Um, thank you so much. Um, Brian, you're actually not the, the last person. I think I am the last person, but I did, before I start talking, I just want to make sure I didn't lose anyone. I didn't lose anyone. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, so even after you said what you said, I'll have to, I'll have to say something new. Uh, you know, obviously just to be very straightforward about this, I think uh, as usual, just tremendously impressed by the rigor uh, and tremendous work of the ICER research teams, the comparative effectiveness team and the economics team, as well as the tremendous insights uh, from the patients who always bring so much in incredible um, personal knowledge to this, uh, the clinical experts and, and everyone. We really tremendously appreciate the time and the work that we know how much work goes into this. And we're, we're incredibly uh, grateful. So, so trying to make sure I say something novel, I, I guess some, several times today we've talked about real world data, which is also sometimes called observational data. And I, I think this is a tricky issue to deal with uh, for a couple of reasons. I, in my mind, observational kind of real world data um, can be complementary to, to randomized control trials. They, they're both good at different things. Randomized trials are really good at rigorously defining comparative efficacy, but, but observational data, which are not available until the FDA approves a drug and it's used in the real world, are, are important for other things, things like assessing effects on disparities, which came up today. Also things like detecting rare side effects. Often we're uncertain about a, a side effect, for example, and real world data, while not as good for comparative comparative efficacy can detect some of these real world effects. But the problem is we have to comment on value-based pricing from the beginning. So we have to make the decisions and the comments that we can make with the knowledge that we have uh, at the time and maybe over time refine those, uh, those estimates. Um, I'm so grateful uh, to all of you and I look forward to seeing you uh, eventually in person and, and, and next time. Thank you, Jason. All right, so you thought you were last, but you're not. I, <laughs> I end up being last again. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody again. I, have, I did think of something I wanted to say quickly on Centers of Excellence. It was that if we could uh, keep our policy roundtable together and have those clinicians, uh, those patients whispering in their ears, um, those insurers and, uh, and the manufacturer continue to create great new treatments, we'd be doing okay. That's pretty good Centers of Excellence. So thank you again to all of them. Um, I think that the, the challenge with, and I mentioned this again in my opening, there's a real sense of celebration around these drugs for myasthenia gravis. It's, I, I think it's fantastic. We all do. Um, we actually have this little calculator. I decided not to bring it out for this meeting because it's, it's a kind of a harsh way to express it, but it actually takes those, remember those families and the individual I showed you in that beginning slide, the people who are harmed by prices increasing you do math and you can show that if we treat these people with these great drugs that work better and we get better health at a price point, if we expand that price point into the healthcare system, we can show how many people are dying who wouldn't die before because they lose their health insurance, how many people have, are forced into rationing their own care and all those things. And it's the eternal struggle of trying to figure out how we celebrate and keep pushing forward in one direction while being sensitive to the people whose voices are not directly heard um, in the room when these drugs are priced um, and even as they're covered. And we end up with more tears in our healthcare system. So there's a, there's a piece of this that is going to be always nagging us to have better evidence to know exactly who will benefit the most so we can get the pricing right for them and make sure that we provide good access in a way that just won't blow back and some other way, again, on, on people, mainly poor, often people of color, who will suffer the, the consequences if we don't take new strides to change the course of the healthcare cost structure in this country. So not to throw a damper on the celebration, but it's, it's a larger picture. And I know that the people, who, all of whom are participated in the meeting today are aware of that. And I think that's part of what I hope we can all take home is the need to continue to work on finding that right balance because we want both. We definitely want both. All right. And with that, I can happily say that you have officially ended a long meeting early, um, at least a few minutes early. Yay. So you can get up, stand up, stomp your feet and enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully your weekend. New England CPAC, thank you for all your work, um, all your conscience, um, your humanity and your, your brain work. Um, and I'll be talking to the ICER team soon and I will share your thanks with them. So everybody on, on the webcast, thank you too. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.